I am starting the recording. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Kinney. I'm a, one of the master naturalists. Been, uh, I don't know, it's probably been about four years, I think, since I got my first <clears throat> master naturalist uh, pin, <laughs> if you will. Um, I live in Chittenango, New York. That's a little bit east of Syracuse. And I've got a bunch of interests. <clears throat> probably my two biggest ones right now are hemlock woolly adelgid, and uh, I teach bird classes. So, and in particular, the bird classes that I teach have to do with birding by ear. So that's what Christy asked me to talk about tonight. So that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so anyway, birding by ear. Let's see if I get this make this work. So what I'll, we'll cover today is uh, I'll do a little bit of an introduction. Um, what I call the four levels of learning progression, which I think is pretty typical for most of us as naturalists. Then I'll get into a little bit of birding by ear, like some background things like the benefits of it and comparing birding by sight versus by ear, and also some specific challenges about birding by ear. Uh, we'll look at some of the tools that I use when I'm teaching the class. And uh, depending on the time, I'll give you as many song examples as, uh, as I've got and we have time for. And then a couple things about references at the end for those of you who would like to pursue this a little farther. So as an introduction though, I just wanted to go over what I, what I call the four levels of learning progression. And this is really just mine. Um, and there's not, it's nothing written about this or anything like that, but um, as a master naturalist in training, and I'll always be in training, this is kind of how I learn. Uh, the first level is really um, kind of a what is it you know, um, type of level. That's where we're really trying to figure out what it is, um, whether it's a plant or it's an animal, you know, we, you sort of need to know what it is before you can get much further into it. After you've learned what it is, then we start learning a little bit more, more about well, what does it do? What's the behavior um, that we see? And then the third level, as we get a little deeper is, well, how does it fit into things? You know, what's the ecology? And is it something that's in balance, something that um, has an effect on the natural balance, or is it something that's completely out of balance? Um, and then the fourth level, the deepest one, where you're really getting involved in an area is, well, uh, sometimes we decide, how do we respond to it? Is there any action that we might take? Uh, do we leave it alone? Do we try to eradicate it? Uh, do we attempt to manage it and things like that? And so that would apply to everything from, like I said, my hemlock woolly adelgid stuff to uh, to some of the birds. And I'm going to use it as an example the golden wing warbler, um, and we'll see how that kind of fits in. So level one again is the identification. What is it? And typically for uh, for birds, most people start off with the visual characteristics. So you would look at this bird. And you say, well, it's small and it's grayish, but it's got this bold head pattern with the black mask, and it's got this a bright yellow crown and uh, the you know the yellow wing, wing patches. So that's the kind of thing that you would use to identify it visually. But also, you can identify a bird like this by a song or a call. And in fact, if you listen here, this is a song, a, a recording of it. You'll hear a kind of a buzzy quality to it. And you're going to hear a couple of different birds in here. So ignore the ones in the background and listen for the buzzy one that goes bee, buzz, buzz, buzz. It sounds almost insect like. So when you hear that bee, buzz, 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 by the way, I hope everybody can hear that. We've played around with the audio, so hopefully that's coming through. But that's that's kind of a characteristic song that you would look for in identifying the golden wing warbler. Now the second level, what does it do? And that's getting into its behavior. Well, we really look at its diet and you know caterpillars, moss, spiders, etc. We talk about its breeding habitat and tangled shrubby habitats, <clears throat> such as the examples I've given here. And we talk about maybe its migration to the Central and South America during the winter. So. Those are some of its, what I would consider its behavior. Level three, well, how does it all fit in? What's the ecology of it? Well, for instance, that's when you start learning that with the golden wing warbler, the populations have really dropped off a lot. And much of it has to do with habitat loss. In fact, they say since the 60s, the golden wing warbler's habitat has decreased by an estimated 43% in the Northern Appalachians. There are other things besides just habitat loss, though. You find out about competition with a blue-winged warbler. They're closely related, and even to the point of they're now interbreeding and they have kind of a hybrid. But it, as this happens, it's literally decreasing the population of the golden-winged warbler even more. And finally, 
there are some issues about nest parrotism by cowbirds. There, there are one, one of our birds that lays their egg in another nest and then uh, kind of takes over. So this has a, um, a detrimental effect on some of the populations, such as the golden winged warbler. So that's kind of some ecology that you learn. And then finally, level four with, well, what do we do? Should we do anything else? And if we do, what kind of things can we do? Well, we can't do too much to reduce competition by the blue wing warbler. That's kind of a natural thing. We really can't do too much about nest parasitism, you know, by the cowbirds, and particularly because it's a native species. But part of the question is, could we increase its habitat and would that maybe make the population uh, bounce back a little bit more? And the way that you cr would create habitat would be use techniques such as clear cutting, burning or grazing, which then would uh, clear forested areas and allow new growth to come up. Um, things like the DEC's Young Forest Initiative, if you haven't heard about that. Um, there are a lot of the wildlife management areas that are shooting for about, these are often in mature forests and they're, they're wanting to get about 10% of that into shrubland or young forest to uh, increase the habitat for certain birds and certain other animals. And that would include the golden winged warbler. And lastly, um, there's something like the EQIP program, which is the Environmental Quality Improvement Pro uh, Program. Uh, this is a grant type program for landowners to create or improve habitat on their property. I actually did a uh, EQIP program about mm, seven or eight years ago now on my property out in Morrisville. And one of the main objectives was to create more habitat for birds like the golden winged warbler and some of the other birds that utilize that same kind of uh, habitat such as uh, thrashers and towhees, other birds like that that are also decreasing in population. So that's kind of an introduction of how I look at it. But well, today we're just going to focus on step number one or level number one, which is identification. And in particular, I'm going to use birds. And in particular, I'm going to use bird songs as a means of identifying them. So you might ask, well, what's the big deal? Why birding by ear? You know, after all, if you've got a good pair of binoculars, that's, that's enough for a lot of people. But the reality is, even though most beginners do tend to concentrate on the visual characteristics, um, sound is still very, very helpful. I mean, humans, by our nature, we are very vision oriented and therefore we tend to grab the binoculars and, you know, kind of watch birds and we, you know, that's the first, that's the first thing. And most people either ignore or don't get really into or are intimidated by the bird sounds. But the reality is <clears throat> that a lot of times there are far more um, identifications can be made by song than actually by eye. And I found this uh, a number of times, and I'll give you a couple of examples. In the springtime before the leaves come on and the birds are migrating through, sure, you can see a lot of birds and it's really cool. But once the leaves pop out, <laughs> suddenly the birds become very, very hard to see at times. You see them flitting around but um, it's really difficult to see. And yet you can hear tons of birds. Um, so if you know what you're listening for, you can oftentimes identify a lot more birds by sound than by sight. Same thing in the winter time, when I go out to do like our, the birding counts in the winter, uh, birds are much less active in the winter. So there's less movement, you're less likely to pick them up. But if they're chipping or if they're singing or making any kind of call, oftentimes that'll, uh, that'll clue you right in that they're there and sometimes you can even identify them by their call or their, or their song. And then lastly, I find that there's a lot of places that are pretty inaccessible, either they're private property or uh, maybe it's a swamp land or something like that. <clears throat> Areas you just can't get to, to be able to get in and see the birds, but you can hear them from a long ways off and therefore you can make identifications uh, from some distance, even if you can't get in there. So birding by sound actually turns out to be a really good and important way of identifying. And I've had people in my classes say that after going to the class and doing the field trips, that literally this has kind of opened up a whole new world for them because before they really weren't hearing um, the bird sounds much, you know, much at all. And now they're really clued into them. So, and of course, even if you don't know the identification, you know, the birds by, by their song or call, it's very helpful for just locating a bird in which you can then identify if you can, you know, if you can actually see it. So birding by ear, it's kind of a, it's a really good, important thing to, uh, to do. There are actually are also some limitations of human vision that would be worth looking at. If you look at this top down, here's looking at the top of the guy's head and you look at a visual field. Um, if you really are concentrating on the central vision, the clear vision, which is what you need to identify a bird, 
you're really talking about a very small sliver, if you will, of the whole visual field that you're using to, uh, to be able to visually identify a bird. And kind of the same thing from the side. So it's a very narrow cone that, uh, that you're looking at when it comes to identifying uh, the characteristics of a bird. That's quite different from hearing because hearing is pretty much 360. You, you can't see behind you, but you certainly can hear things behind you on the side, above, below. So it really gives you, it's kind of sound around and um, that's really helpful um, if you know what you're looking for or listening for. To go back to vision for a second too, I don't know if any of you are familiar with what we call splatter vision. Um, if you've ever done any survival courses or anything like that, they oftentimes talk about splatter vision. And what that basically means is, is when you look out, you let your vision spread out. And you, oftentimes if you can look toward the horizon and just expand your peripheral vision and not focus on any one thing, then what you're doing is you're increasing this 3% or this, you know, this little cone of central vision. What you're doing is you're increasing it to take in all of this extra peripheral vision and um, you can actually pick up a lot of things in that peripheral vision, such as um, movement. And that's one of the most important things is when you look unfocused, you can pick up very fine motions. And once you do, then you can focus your central vision on that. Um, it's a very te useful technique for naturalists because it really increases your awareness and really helps to your powers of observation. But what's interesting is <clears throat> even though we teach this, uh, uh, this technique for provision, it's kind of, you know, so the same thing. You can use the same idea um, with hearing. I, <laughs> I'm not sure if you'd call it splatter hearing. It sounds kind of strange, but it is a similar idea. And the whole idea is to take in all the sounds around you kind of in an unfocused manner. And then when you hear something of interest, focus your attention on that particular sound. So if you're out there in the woods on some morning and hear this, a variety of songs and you're kind of taking it all in and not focusing in on any one particular bird song but just being aware that they're all there and then if you happen to hear something that really interests you intrigues you then use your ears to you know to kind of hone in on that one particular one and listen very carefully and see if you can tell what it is so i kind of i teach Kind of the same thing as splatter vision, but I teach it with uh, with uh, birding by ear, and I call it splatter hearing. Um, to backtrack a little bit, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I get interested in birding by ear because I mean, I, I when I grew up and I was watching birds as a kid, I was always with a binocular and I didn't really pay too much attention to uh, to the sounds. But uh, when I was uh, stationed out in Texas, uh, my son and I used to go out to Lost Maples Park. And every time we would come, be coming out of the park, there was this one canyon we had to get through to get to the parking lot. And I always used to hear this bird, and this is what it sounded like. And I always thought, that, it's such an interesting and cool sound, especially the way it descends and slows as it goes down. And I, for the life of me, I didn't know what it was, and so I had to go back, and I was very curious, and I looked around at various things, and eventually I found it. And it turns out it's a canyon wren. So this little wren makes this really crazy sound, and especially in a canyon where it echoes around a little, it was pretty awesome. So that kind of got started piquing my interest in bird sounds. And then when I retired from the Air Force, I did an Appalachian Trail through hike, and there was a few birds that used to drive me crazy because I was hiking through so fast I couldn't stop, and I didn't have binoculars with me. But I kept hearing these sounds, and here was one sound that used to drive me nuts. And I hear this all the time in the woods. It's all the way up through the Appalachians, I hear it. And it wasn't until after I got <laughs> finished with the trail that I looked up this one also. And it turns out this was something called an oven bird, which I actually had seen, but I didn't see it singing, and I had no idea it was the same bird. And an oven bird's a little ground warbler, but they, they're out in the woods, and they sing all the time. And uh, really, the, the classic mnemonic is teacher, 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 teacher. But I'll bet you if you've been out in the woods around here, you have probably heard of and birds may not even recognize them. Another bird that I used to hear all the time is this one. Now it turns out that 
turns out that that's actually not a bird's song. That's actually a call. And it's a call of the scarlet tanger. And I used to hear this all the time, and I never could find it. You'd think a scarlet tanger would be easy to see, but they tend to hang out in the, up in the canopies and stuff where it's you know, difficult to see when the leaves are out. But, so that was another one that I had to look up after I got back and, again, piqued my interest in bird songs. But this one, when I got up into Vermont, New Hampshire, I used to hear a lot. And it was just the most beautiful song that uh, I had ever heard, but I had no idea what it was until I asked one of the rangers. Listen to this one. And, and I, I really hope that you can appreciate the, not only the melodic nature, but this really high pitched tinkling and everything else, but also the length of it. I mean, that's about the longest bird song I had ever heard before. And I finally asked one of the rangers, what the heck is that? And she informed me that that's a winter wren. Now, since then, I've heard winter wrens even around here, and I just absolutely love to hear them because it is such a unique song, but the length of it is just phenomenal for this little tiny bird. So anyway, because of all that, I ended up getting into, you know, birding by ear more and more, and eventually to the point where my local uh, Audubon Society asked me if I would teach a course in it. And so I do, I have for the past four years. Actually, I was, this one got canceled because of the pandemic, but we had four courses before and the goals of that are really not only to have people try to hear more things in other words become more aware more tuned into all the bird sounds that are out there but also to improve their active listening skills and this is really important there's a big difference between hearing and listening hearing is just a passive reception of sound whereas listening really requires brain processing and focus um, and part of uh, what we do is improve those active listening skills by listening to bird songs and analyzing them and listening to them over and over and describing them. And that's, that's the way that you, you know, they start really learning the bird songs pretty well. And just like the participants have learned in the past to visually identify birds based on certain characteristics, now they get to recognize distinguishing aspects of the bird's vocalizations and can usually identify birds from that. And typically what they do is a lot of times birds have maybe long songs, but there may be a particularly unique portion of that song, something that really stands out and is unique. And uh, they'll hear, hear it and they'll listen and all of a sudden they hear that unique part and they say, aha, that I know and it's a, it's a blah, blah, blah. And we call that the song's handle. And so teaching people with those, those handles, those unique portions are a really good way to be able to start identifying birds. There actually are four ways that I use to help represent the song when we're describing it. I'm gonna go through them real quickly and then give you some examples. So one way that we use to, uh, to represent the song is to transcribe the sound into words. And this is a little challenging, but I'll, wait a second, I'll give you a couple of examples. Another thing we, that I do is we compare the bird sounds to some other familiar sounds that they would, be, that they would know. Okay, and I'll give you some examples of those. There are also are some descriptive words that we kind of use frequently. Uh, these, are, these are tough though, because when you're describing a bird song, it's very subjective and people, one person will hear something and other people will hear something quite different. And there is no one set of standardized words or descriptive words that we use. So again, this is a little difficult, um, but still helpful in some cases. And finally, I torture the students in the class by we actually draw songs using diagrams and symbols. And most, most of them really hate this, <laughs> but it is valuable because what you have to do is listen over and over and over and try to draw this song and everything else. And the real value there is in the repetition more than the, than the actual diagrams, but uh, we're not gonna talk about that one today. But let's talk and give you some examples of what these uh, tools are. So let's talk first about describing sounds into words or transcribing them into words. One way to do that is we'll use what what's called phonetics, and that's putting the sounds into a written form so that somebody else would recognize them. And for instance, I gave you an example. I think you should be able to see this is the uh, tweepado 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 tweep. Now this happens to be the uh, the description, if you will, of a, one of the two descriptions of a Carolina wren. But there are certain things that you can get from that. For instance, the capitalized T-W-E-E -E means you're gonna accent that, so it's twee. The E-E -E gives you that longer sound, so it's twee. And then the natural way that we speak tends to, the last two uh, syllables 
will tend to drop off. So it's tweepido, tweepido, yeah, tweepido. Um, so that's that's phonetics, and that's trying to transcribe the sounds into written words. Another way that we do this sometimes we use onomatopoeia, um, and I'm sure most of you have heard that before. Things like chirp, cheep, and tweet. Don't use them very often. I guess you know if you talk about a hoop for an owl or a gobble of a turkey, yes, but most of these other ones are pretty non-specific and not terribly useful for us. But the one <clears throat> that is very helpful and we use a lot of are mnemonics. And basically what mnemonics are, it's kind of a memory aid. It's some pattern of letters, phrases, ideas, whatever, that assists you in remembering it. And I'll go through several um, um, examples of mnemonics that we would use as a way to remember or to identify birds, okay? So here's an example. We're going to use phonetics and mnemonics both on some of these. So let's start off with the phonetics. This is what you'll oftentimes see in a bird book. They'll describe this, the song as being so, see, dee, 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 dee. Now, I got to tell you, most of the time when I look at these things, I kind of roll my eyes and go, I have no idea really what that means or how to, you know, how to say it, because it doesn't tell you anything about the pitch. It doesn't tell you anything about changes in the tempo. It doesn't say anything about the actual pattern. Although there is some um, about, the, about the pattern here. So what I want you to do is listen to, look at the description and then listen to the actual song and see if you can fit, them, fit the two together. Having heard that, you can sort of get, I, I can't sing that high, but so see, see, dee, 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 if you can bear with me. <clears throat> um, so you can sort of see if you do, if you recognize the song and then you look at the words, it's a little bit better, but trying to do it the other way around, just looking at the words first is pretty tough. There is a mnemonic, however, we use for this particular song, and that is Old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Now this doesn't sound really like the bird's song, but it does give you a good pattern. So if you listen to this and say, old Sam Peabody, 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 um, I think you'll kind of catch on. So listen again and listen for that. <clears throat> yeah. Now, some of you right off the bat would say, yeah, but I kind of like the old sweet Kimberly, Kimberly, Kimberly better. Or some of you, if you're north of the border may say, I like, oh, sweet, Canada, 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 whatever. The important thing is that any of these, whichever one floats your boat, they kind of give you that pattern when you say them. It, it's a good way of remembering the pattern, even though it doesn't sound exactly like the bird itself. This happens to be the song of the white-throated sparrow. But most people recognize it or remember it as old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Okay. Here's another one. Let's go over another one. So this, most people would say, yes, fee be, fee be ye. And that's actually pretty close to what it actually sounds like, although it doesn't tell you anything about the pitch or the quality. So I want you to listen now to this and see if you can match the two up. So, so as you <laughs> gotta get to stop playing. All right, so that's a nice, sweet Phoebe, Phoebe. Um, and, and a lot of people, as a way of remembering it, one of the mnemonics, instead of saying Phoebe, is saying, is a cheeseburger, cheeseburger, or hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie. And now I happen to like hey, sweetie. And the reason is because the sweetie part, if you listen to that bird's song, that's kind of a nice, sweet sounding um, uh, song. And so, Hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie, is sounds to me anyway, very similar. It gives you the same pattern and the sweet reminds you a little bit about it. And that's actually the song of the black cap chickadee. Now, most of you go, wait a minute, I thought chickadee said chickadee dee dee, and the answer is they do, that's the call. But this actual song of the chickadee is this Phoebe, Phoebe ye, okay? Now there's another bird that also says Phoebe and it says its name because it is the, actually the Eastern Phoebe. But since it says its own name, is there a difference between the two? 
I've had a lot of people when they hear the ch the black cap chickadee saying Phoebe, they think that that's a Phoebe because it's saying its name, but it's not. So let's listen to the actual Phoebe song and listen in particular to the pitch and the loudness and the quality of it to say, how is this different from the chickadee? Here's the Phoebe. <laughs> So you can hear it's Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. So it says it, but that Phoebe is far different from the chickadees. Okay, so again, this is part of the thing. They both sort of say Phoebe, and yet the pitch and the quality and everything else is, is quite different and is quite distinctive for each one of the birds. Here's another example. Most people would read this and go, Jink. Denk T. So Jink Denk T. Um, I would have a hard time knowing for sure what that was, but if you listen to the bird song, you'll probably see that it makes some sense. Oh, shoot. Sorry. So the mnemonic, as you saw me pop up here, actually for this, most people remember this song is Drink Your Tea. So Drink Your Tea. So listen to it again, see if you can hear the drink your tea. And that happens to be the uh, Eastern Tohi. And again, these are some of the ones when you, when you know the, the mnemonic in particular, it's a great memory aid, because you'll hear that out there and you'll go, ah, drink, that's the drink your tea bird. And it'll clue you right into the, being the Tohi. All right, here's another one. Now, this one looks like it should be pretty straightforward. After all, it's either a who or a ho, but we'll go with who. Hoo hoo, ho ho, hoo 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 ho ho. Uh. <laughs> and again, if you look at that, it'd be hard pressed to be able to come up with what that actually sounds like. But let's listen to the bird and see what the phonetics, how close they came. <laughs> so you could probably make a case for saying hoo hoo hoo, hoo 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 hoo. hoo uh. But that's not exactly very memorable. So the classic mnemonic that we use for helping with the both the sound, but in particular the pattern, is who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. So listen and see if you can hear that. <laughs> and once you've heard the barred owl out there in the woods a couple of times, and you remember the who cooks for you, that's the who cooks for you bird right there. That's the barred owl. So again, mnemonics can be, can be really quite helpful. One more example, um, and again, to show you kind of how complicated some of these get, this is, a, this is one of the descriptions from uh, one of the bird books. C, 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 to Z, Tippo, Z, Z, Z. Now, if any of you can figure out what that is from, from that description, I, I bow to you. Uh, but the reality is, uh, that's a tough one. So let's listen to the song first. Again, that would be a pretty tough one to tell from just this one alone. Um, and this is one of those birds that, you know, you kind of have to hear a bunch of times and then after a while you get used to it because it's so common. But I do want to share with you the mnemonic to show how creative some people can be. The actual mnemonic for this bird song is, maids, 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 won't you please put on your tea kettle for me? And if you do it like it's supposed to be, it's maids, 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 won't you please put on your tea kettle for me? And it took me quite a while to practice that, by the way. I hope you're all appreciative of that. So let's listen to it again and see if you can kind of get the maids, 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 won't you please put on your tea kettle. Listen again. Oh, forget that one. Let's try again. So with a little imagination, you can sort of hear the maids, 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 won't you please put on your tea kettle for me. And what that does though, it does, it helps you divide it. There's really three sections to the song. There's the maids, maids, maids. Then there's the won't you please. And then there's that kind of scrambly thing at the end of put on your tea kettle for me. It's kind of like all over the place. But after a while you get used to this. And this is a, this is a somewhat familiar repeating pattern for the uh, song sparrow although there's a huge amount of variation in the song sparrows. They even have their own local dialects and everything else. 
But after a while, you begin to recognize that same or similar pattern um, as you're out and you recognize it as the song sparrow. All right, well, let's give you a couple of examples for the second method, which is to compare bird songs to other familiar sounds that you would already know. Um, the black and white warbler <clears throat> is oftentimes um, described as sounding like a squeaky wheel. Now, as you listen to it, I gotta tell you, before I knew about the squeaky wheel thing, it always rem reminded me of my old dog who was chewing on a squeaky toy. You know, he did a squeaky, 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 squeaky. But this is what I, I want you to hear it and see which one it sounds like to you. So you can kind of imagine a you know a little kid maybe with a with a like a wagon wheel that needs a little bit of grease, and as they're pulling it along, it's going squeak it squeak it squeak it squeak it squeak it. So that's that's oftentimes uh, you know just used as a description for the black and white warbler, or for instance a field sparrow. This is one of my favorite ones. I always like to bring on my uh, get a table, get a ping pong ball, and and have people listen. To that. So see if you can just see why this is this is described as a ping pong ball being dropped on a table. And I think any of you who have ever dropped a ping pong ball, ping pong ball on a table, that's exactly what it's like, ding, 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 as it gets faster and faster. So we'll be out on um, field trips and someone will say, oh, I just heard the ping pong bird. And everybody immediately knows they, they make that mental connection um, with, the, uh, with the field sparrow. And one last one, this is one of my favorite ones. I love the bobolinks when they're around. And this is this is what I call the R two D two song. R two D two. I mean, you got to admit that sounds like some one of the one of the uh, one of the robots there on uh, on Star Wars. Okay, so those so that's another way we 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 look at some of the bird songs and we say, well, it sounds like some other thing that we're already familiar with. And then the third one is to use descriptive words and phrases. Let me give you a couple of examples. The uh, wit rush is oftentimes described as a f having a flute-like quality, at least in part. Listen to it. So there obviously are more components than just the flutish, wooden flutish uh, type of um, uh, type of portion of it, but still, um, that's kind of uh, typical of the wit rush. Now the Acadian flycatcher is a good example of something that would be considered abrupt. So listen to this. That was it. I mean, that's that's the entire thing. And oftentimes that's, you know, for mnemonics, people describe that as being pizza. And so that's one of what I call the snack birds because it's one of many that sound like some kind of a snack food. Here's an ascending one. This is a prairie warbler. Listen to it go up. So that's pretty descriptive. Here's a grackle. It's oftentimes described as some as being harsh. Or maybe a red-tailed hawk sounding like a scream. Or maybe a house wren, what I would describe as kind of bubbly. So again, these are these are common words that may be used to try to describe what you're hearing. The problem with it is, again, people people hear different things and they describe it in different ways. There's no standard set of descriptive words out there. So this is a little subjective and a little bit fuzzy, you know, for for a lot of people, as opposed to the mnemonics, for instance. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of other uh, you know examples though. Here's a descriptive word. This, phrase actually. This is a bird song that's described as a note spiraling down a hollow metal tube. See if you can hear that in this song. So I think you know with a little imagination you sort of get that impression of that note as it's spiraling down a metal tube and that happens to be the theory one of our thrushes, one of about four or five thrushes that we find pretty commonly here in central New York, but you'll hear them out in the deep woods uh, quite, frank, quite uh, frequently. One of the interesting things since I brought this one though, I, I've got to share one other thing with you. 
birds are kind of unique in that many of them, if not most, have actually a double syrinx. It's kind of like their voice box. It's like two of them. So they're actually able to produce two distinct sounds and they can kind of mix them. Much more complicated uh, system than our single voice box that we have. And the other thing about that is um, birds, we believe, they hear it, they process and hear things at a much faster rate than humans. So one way to get a little bit better idea of what the bird may be hearing is to take the normal song and then slow it down. So I'm going to play the normal sound again. This is the normal sound. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the same bird, the same song, but slow down to a quarter speed. And listen to here, this is what they hear. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but the first time I heard that, that just totally blew my mind. I, 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 I'm fascinated. Even now, I go back and every time I hear that, it sounds so unbelievable that that could be the same thing that we're hearing, but just basically slowed way down. And it's more likely um, a much more nuanced, um, complicated thing that the birds are actually hearing. So pretty interesting. Here's some other descriptive words we use, like chipping, trilling, buzzing, chattering, and rattling. Let me give you a couple of examples. Chipping is pretty self-evident. So there are a number of birds that, that do, you know, chipping, especially when they're uh, just sitting in the bushes and you're trying to walk by, you'll hear that a lot. That's chipping. Now, if the next one I'm going to do is if, if you take a chipping, but make it much faster, then it becomes a trill. And here's a dark-eyed junco trilling. And then if you take that even, you take those notes and make them even faster, so fast that you almost can't hear the distinction between them, it becomes a buzz, almost like an insect. So here's a blue-winged blue warbler buzzing. Oh, here it is. So you, uh, sorry. So um, we went from chipping to trilling to buzzing. And then the very last thing we'll uh, let's have you listen to a belted king kingfisher, which is a chattering or a rattling. And that's a very distinctive thing if you ever around water and you'll hear that chattering, that's always the belted kingfisher, okay? So those are some of the other descriptive words that we, uh, that we use. So what I'd like to do now is, you know, this is kind of a, a big, uh, you know, a whole course and a whole bunch of things that are all compressed into a short time. But let me go over a couple of birds that pretty much all of you should recognize and then go over some that you may not. Here's some ones that most everybody would recognize. <laughs> most people would listen to this, okay, those are <laughs> How about this one? So most of you would recognize the caw, caw, cawing of a crow. Here's another. And if you've ever heard crows, <clears throat> you know that they make a f great deal more noise and you know, sounds than those, but those are the you know, pretty classic ones. And then here's another one that you probably would recognize. So most people would recognize it because the bird says its own name once again. It says, J, J, J. And that's a blue jay, but blue jays make a lot of other noises too. Um, there's somebody, there's somebody on that probably is pounding on a table that needs to get muted. I'm not sure. Are we still there? All right, and then. Now that didn't sound anything like Jay at all, but that, you know, uh, Blue Jays can make some very unusual sounds, um, including things that sound like, uh, you know, whistles and car doors and other things like that. I often tell, tell the students, if you hear something out in the woods and it doesn't sound like it's from this planet, think Blue Jay. So there's a couple other ones that I'm sure most of you would recognize. <laughs> So as before, where we heard the barred owl singing its who cooks for you, this is a typical great horned owl 
with it's just as you know uh, more standard hooting if you will how about this one i think most of you would recognize a wild turkey you know out with, you know with the gobbling and things so again most people actually do know you know a lot more bird songs than they might think here's one more the common one <laughs> So most people would recognize that certainly as a duck, and it turns out that mallards are really one of the only ducks that truly quack. I'm not a wild, you know, a, a, a waterfowl expert, but my understanding is they're one of the few ones that actually quack. So uh, mallard ducks are pretty common. Well, let's listen to some other songs that you may not recognize right off, or maybe you do, and I'm not sure what it is. So here's the first one, and I labeled this as cheery because when I teach the course. Yeah, we all, I, I kind of insist that when people hear the song, that they have to bounce around a little bit when they say this, and they have to go, cheery up, cheery, cheery, cheery up, and make all kinds of cheery sounds like that. So listen to this cheery song. Yeah. Kind of hard when you get up in the morning and you hear that, it's kind of hard not to do that. Unless, of course, that that robin is singing right outside your bedroom window, and it's five o'clock in the morning and you want to sleep and then it's not maybe so cheery but um, we actually use the american robin as one of the central birds in the course because it has so many different ver uh, variations on its uh, on its songs and calls plus there's a lot of other birds that sound very similar we, they're robin like but there are distinct uh, differences that would make you realize it's not a robin it's something else so we spend actually a lot of time listening and, and uh, really learning the american robin pretty well Here's one that I'm going to label as horse. And the reason is this is a song, a, a bird that has a robin like song. So think of what you just heard. But instead of being nice and clear, this one is, sounds like a robin with a sore throat. Listen and see if you can hear that. So and like that nice cheery song that you hear, a very clear whistle that you hear of the of the robin, this one's got a little bit of a of a buzzy quality to it, almost like it's got a like a little horse or a little sore throat, and that, that's why it's described as a robin with a sore throat. And that's back to that scarlet tanager. So its call may be chipper, but its song is kind of robin like. Okay. Um, another here's another one. This is a I put it as clear because of the fact that it is a very clear, sharp, very distinct whistle. So listen to it. Or here's another. I'm sure many of you have probably heard that out in your backyards before. Here's another song, same bird. So these are all all various songs of nice clear whistle of the uh, northern cardinal and i put a picture of both the male and female because this is one of the birds that both male and female are really excellent songsters they both will be singing the same you know the same type of song they're both very good here's another one this is one you'll frequently see when you're out in marshy areas or shrubby areas and the interesting thing about it is it's kind of a random thing there very rambling there's all kinds of weird noises like chips and squeaks and whistles sometimes there's other bird you know parts of bird songs that are kind of uh you know thrown in there but the key thing is there's no real pattern to it like most birds it's very random so listen to this one So if you listen to the, you know, the gray catbird, again, unlike like the mockingbird or a brown thrasher, which have a dis much more distinct pattern or re a repeated pattern, the gray catbird is just kind of all over the place with all kinds of different noise. It's very, very random. And of course, if I'm sure if you remember back when I first played, the very first thing, it, very first sound it made was kind of a giveaway. Listen to this. <laughs> so when you hear that interspersed amongst everything else, it's a pretty good clue that it's a, it's a catbird since it sounds so much like a cat. This is a bird, if you're out hiking um, in the woods, you're gonna hear a lot um, here in central New York, and you're gonna hear it all summer long, and you're gonna hear it even you know, all day long, even during the, uh, the heat of the day a lot of times. Very monotonous, 
after a while, it kind of drives you a little bit crazy, but I want you to listen to this one. And the, uh, the mnemonic for that, as you can see down at the bottom, is here I am, over here, look up, see me. So let me kind of say that along with the song. Here I am, over here, look up, see me, up here, there you go. And part of the reason for saying that, it's kind of this sing-songy voice, but it's very monotonous. It's just, it just goes on and on and on until you just want to throw rocks up in the, uh, up in the trees at it. Um, but that's our red-eyed red vireo. We actually have about mm, four different varieties of vireos that are commonly found around here, but by far and away the most common is the red-eye. And uh, you'll hear, like I said, especially when you're out hiking in the woods, you'll hear this a lot. You don't see them very often because they tend to be up in the canopy, um, and they're somewhat reclusive, but you'll hear them all the time. Here's an example of, I guess I'll call this forlorn. And this is another bird that says its own name. So listen up. And then the part that deflates a little bit. <laughs> so this is our Eastern wood peewee. So again, this is a bird that kind of says its own name, peewee, peewee. And uh, uh, it's commonly found also out in the woods. Most of the birds that I'm teaching and everything else have, they're either woodland or tend to be around shrublands. And I'm gonna give you, I think one or two more. The first one is I'll call loopy because it's, you'll hear the same thing over and over again. So this is the classic, um, the, the mnemonic or the phonetic almost really is, wichity, wichity, wichity. And you'll hear this either wichity, wichity, or wichity, wichity, or some version of that anyway. And this is the uh, common yellow throat. You'll see these along, we see them all the time along the canals, like marshy lands, shrublands. Um, sometimes out in the woods, if you got a little clearing, you'll find them. But uh, they're very common, very territorial, and but they're also very vocal. So you'll hear that wichity, wichity. Here it is again. So that's the common yellow throat. Oh yes, and I did include one more, the, ma the maniacal one. So I'm sure you probably have heard this one before out in the woods. It's kind of like the, the crazy jungle bird and you oftentimes hear them when they're flying and You'll hear it coming toward you, coming, getting louder and louder, and then goes away as it flies over you. But it's uh, quite interesting, and that's the uh, pileated woodpecker. So, again, I'm using these, some of these just as descriptions um, of things that you might hear out in the woods that you might know and might not. And I think you've heard this one before. I'll end with this one because it's one of my favorite songs. I'm out walking in the woods, very musical. That's the ELA of the wood thrush. Absolutely gorgeous bird. All right, so uh, in summary, I mean, birding by ear, there's no question about the fact that it's, it's kind of challenging. And for some people, it's a little bit intimidating because they don't even know where to start. So, uh, but I can tell you that by doing it, by learning even just some of the basic birds, some common birds, and then gradually expanding your repertoire, if you will, it can be very rewarding. And again, it greatly augments the identification um, of birds. Like I said, there'll be times all two thirds of the birds that I identify will be immediately by, by um, sound as opposed to be uh, looking for visual characteristics. I also want to just reemphasize that that active focused listening, which is how you really start learning, analyzing, describing these songs, really is a, it's a skill and it can be improved with practice. A lot of it's becoming more aware of the songs. That's the hearing part of it. Um, some of it has to do with reducing the distractions you know, around you and everything else. But again, hearing it, describing it, uh, and then leading to an identification uh, is, really, uh, is really something that can be uh, learned and, and can be learned. And you can get very good at it just with practice. 
Uh, repetition without question is one of the most important things, which is why in the course we will listen to it, you know, over and over and over. And then we, when we take it out in the field, we will listen to the same birds over and over again because that's, um, that's what it takes. I tell most of the people who take the course that by the third year <laughs> after you've taken the course, you'll be really good because it literally takes, we tend to learn it and then you forget it with the nine, you know, over the nine months that the birds are gone. And then you learn it again the next summer and then you relearn it the following summer. And usually by then it's pretty much, you know, ingrained in your brain. So uh, memory aids, like we talked about, especially like the mnemonics can be very useful in remember, trying to remember what these uh, bird songs uh, are. And uh, lastly, just as a general note for master naturalists, uh, these same techniques to, uh, to improve your awareness and focus can really improve your overall observational skills, which makes us all better naturalists, I think, in the end. So with that, um, I will just mention one other thing that had to do with resources. Um, this is one, if you are actually interested in learning and you don't have time to take a course right off, Peterson Field Guides makes this one, it's a three CD set called Birding by Ear, and it's for the Eastern and Central region. And unlike most CDs, which just are like a catalog of bird songs, and I don't find them to be particularly helpful for learning songs. They're good for refreshing your memory after you've learned them. But this one actually teaches. And in fact, the way that I organized my course is very similar to the way these guys did their course, which really made me mad because I spent a lot of time you know, developing my course, then find out I probably could have taught right from this CD set. So I, I like the way that they do that. They also, they create these learning groups of similar vocalizations and spend a lot of time describing the distinguishing characteristics. And they use a lot of the same tools that I've just talked about that I use, uh, you know, when I'm teaching. So uh, this is, I think this is a uh, very worthwhile if you wanted to actually learn um, about birding by ear um, by a, a course that teaches it. And of course you can take courses like uh, the Bird Academy and Cornell Lab. They have a car course called Be a Better Birder. I have never actually taken that, but I'm sure if it's Cornell, they've uh, done a really good job. And I would just put in one last plug and that is to take advantage of any of your locally sponsored birding hikes um, or courses. Like for instance, I mean, I'm here at the uh, Onondaga Audubon um, for a year, for several years, I went on every bird hike I could think of because they're usually led by people who are quite knowledgeable and you will pick up quite a, quite a few things and a lot of tips by listening to uh, these people who have been birding for years and years. So with that, I will end this presentation and maybe a couple of minutes for questions. Christy, if, if we've got time. Thanks so much, Steve. That was really, really excellent. Um, I know when I, I learned um, bird calls, I didn't learn bird calls until I was in grad school and it really does open up a whole new world. And when you're outdoors, you can hear a certain call and know about specific habitat features that might be nearby just based on yep. what you're hearing. So um, you did a great job of describing, you know, how to, how to learn calls and how to, you know, identify with them. And we do have some uh, questions. Um, first, oh, Jill, uh, Jill Rothstein asked if it was going up on the YouTube channel. Yes, this and all the presentations um, will go up on the YouTube channel. Um, but Jill had another question, which I thought was very, uh, very good. She lives in New York City, and she asked, where's the pigeon? Where's the pigeon call? <laughs> the pigeon call. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, no, don't do pigeons out here, you know. <laughs> Um, if anybody has a question, you, you're, you can feel free to unmute yourself now. Um, there was a question, what's the difference between a song and a call, Jill asked. Yeah, that really is a good question and there's no distinct or definite answer to that. Generally, when we think of a, most people think of a song, they think it's this, it's the nice, sweet, melodic one versus a call, which is some short, you know, chip or whatever else. But um, that, that really doesn't hold very often. So it's a better way, I think, to think about it is songs are typically the ones that are used for establishing your territory, attracting a mate, and maintaining your territory. Okay, those are, that's more typically, it's kind of a functional definition of a song, whereas calls tend to be more communication between the birds, but not necessarily having to do with sex or territory. So. Um, but it still is very difficult. Like if you're, for instance, if you listen to a, a, like 
most of the birds in the flycatcher family, well, they don't have anything that's very melodic. <laughs> they do the same thing pretty much over, you know, a lot of times over and over again. Uh, so the question is, is that raspy sound that they're making, is that a call or is that a song? And again, it's really hard to be able to say for sure, but I think I would, I tend to think of it again as using the functional definition that songs are for territory and mating um, generally and calls are for alarms or communication. That's, that's how I think of it in my very concrete way. Can I ask another question? Sure. Yes. Hey, this is Jill again in, in New York City. Um, Steve, I found this so enjoyable. So thank you so, so much. Yeah, um, I wanted to know if you're doing any more online teaching, if you could email that out, I'd love to go to more. I also was curious if you've ever taught um, birding by ear for the blind. Uh, I never have uh, taught birding by ear for the blind. I, it's an interesting thought. I've never really, I just, yeah, never had this. As I, as I mentioned, this all came, the reason I started teaching the classes in the first place was I was going on birding hikes with some of these experts. And these are people who have been birding for 30 years or something like that. And what, there would be a group of about 20 people, you know, in a long line walking through the woods. And all of a sudden the leader would stop and say, oh, there's a rose-breasted grosbeak. And everybody would go, what, huh? And it would kind of pass down the line until you got to the end. And then by the time they got down there, they didn't even know what they were listening to. So um, I used to spend my time in the back, you know, and I was kind of, you know, working with a couple of my friends and we were going over and analyzing birds kind of on our own. So that's, they finally said, well, you need to teach your own course. <laughs> so that's how I kind of got roped into it. Um, I, and I tell you, I haven't done any of their online stuff because my teaching style, if you will, it tends to be, it's, it's very personal one-on-one. -on -one. I really love that that group setting, if you will, the small group setting, and it is very difficult to do that by you know by the internet. I know well, I this was really great. Though. Thank you. What's it? I'm sorry. Say again. Oh, I just said this was really great. Thank you. Well, thank you. But yeah, but the chorus, for instance, the uh, we do um, four four classrooms, which is about two hours. So that's about eight hours of classroom. They've got homework that they go home and analyze bird songs at home. And we have anywhere between six and eight field trips that we go on to put it all to use. And that's, that's in one course. And I teach a basic course, and then I teach an advanced one for anybody who's already done the basic and wants to go on a little bit more. But it's really hard to do all that if you're talking about online. So this is my, this is my first foray into online teaching. Jill, last, um, last year when we were all um, in the city for that weekend, uh, I think we mentioned it at, during another session at one point, um, when we went to that Inwood Hill Park in the city, um, it was amazing to me, the, the woodland birds that we heard. Uh, we heard wood thrushes and other species that I typically associate with larger patches of forest, but because that's nice old growth forest there, those birds were there. So that's a great birding spot, I think. Her. Yeah, thanks, Inwood, and Inwood's great, and the ramble and everything. Thank you guys so much. I have to go, but bye. Okay, bye, take care. Um, Steve, there's another question from Ginger. It says, I think I saw a common yellow throat today. It had the mask and appeared tannish. I didn't see the yellow throat, though. I wasn't looking for it since it was a new bird for me. Is there anything similar, or did I just miss the yellow? I'll bet you probably missed the yellow. He said it was tannish, but it had a black mask. I mean, it's what I call the Lone Ranger bird. Like, let's see. It's yes, it did, yes, it did. It did have the mask, and that's a good way of describing it—the Lone Ranger. Yeah, yeah, that probably probably was a common yellow throat. Okay. Thank you. Right. I'm trying to think if there's any other ones that jumped immediately to mind that have a black mask, but uh, you know, things like a hooded warbler—they have more of a balaclava than a mask. So it was, it was probably the it was probably the common yellow throat. Okay, thanks. Did you happen to hear the uh, hear it singing? Because they're, they're usually pretty prolific singers and they do the witchity, witchity, witchity song. Uh, it was it was in my garden uh, outside the window, so I couldn't hear it. Okay, next time definitely listen for it. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's another question. Michelle asks, um, are there any helpful apps to use if you record a song? Assuming. Uh, you mean 
for recording or for identifying based on the recording? Uh, to identify based on the recording. Hmm. Yeah, there are, there's a couple new ones and I, I tell you, I don't use them and I, <laughs> I will give you my bias for that. It's kind of like, for me, it's like Google. Um, oftentimes if I want an answer just real quick, if I don't, I just Google it and I don't even think about it. And uh, it's kind of making me sort of lazy when it com comes to using my brain. And I, th I think I would do the same thing if I had the app, which, you know, just hold the app, hold the phone up and it automatically tells you what it is. Um, so I actually don't use and don't have any experience with using the uh, the apps, but supposedly there are a couple of good ones that have come out that are pretty decent as far as being able to identify what bird you're hearing. Hey, thank you. Yeah, there are, and there are, um, since you brought up recording, there are some good apps, and if you go on to Cornell's webpage, they talk about uh, doing bird recordings. I am amazed at how clear and how high quality some of the recordings I can make out just using my iPhone. Um, I, I was pretty stunned as far as how much it actually picks up. And, uh, and Cornell's even got some suggestions for those of you who want to do another step beyond that. You can actually get a little microphone that plugs into your iPhone. It's like a directional mic and you can uh, kind of hone down on a particular bird even better. I use this all the time. I record, and, uh, record birds out in the field and I send it around to my students, my past students just a, as a challenge to see if they can identify, you know, what birds, because most of the time, those are variations on the, uh, on the classic, you know, classic bird set. So unfortunately, I can't give you too much information though on the, uh, the Shazam for birds. <laughs> Is it Merlin? I don't know if Merlin can do it from re recordings or if it's just uh, Merlin's an app to, re to ID bird calls, you know, I think live, but I don't know if it can do um, recordings. Does anybody else know? I know that they've expanded Merlin so great. It's got a huge amount of stuff in it now, but um, it's not an app that I happen to use. So. I've tried Song Sleuth, but it's Song not Sleuth. that great. Yeah. You have I, to get a real, it's just got to be one bird out there and be very clear. Right. It's just, it's just that sometimes I'll record it if I don't know what it is and I come home and I don't even know where to begin, how to figure out what it is. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. We've all done that. <laughs> um, but even, even if you just uh, get a decent recording of it, you can go back and listen to it. And again, kind of go through that, the process that I was talking about of trying to describe it, trying to figure out what's its pattern. Then if you at least have an idea, you know, is it a warbler? Is it a, you know, one of the songbirds? Is it a flycatcher? If you have a general idea, I'll, I'll sometimes just go through the, uh, my, my own app, like my Sibley's app, and go through and listen to it until I find it's like, oh, there it is, that's what it was. And sometimes that's how you discover, you know, uh, I, I always tell, tell the students too, it's really not, the harder it is, the more likely you're going to remember it. It's the it's struggling with it and fi finally coming up with the right answer. That's what really makes it stick in your brain sometimes, so. All right, thanks a lot. And by the way, I, Deb, I did try the song Sleuth too, I, I, now that you mentioned it, and I wasn't terribly impressed with it. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? All right, thanks so much, Steve. Um, this was really excellent. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us. And I hope that next year you'll be able to get back out, get back at it. <laughs> uh, I hope so too.